Hey everyone, this is a Barclay Damon Live broadcast of the Cyber Sip, practical talk about cybersecurity. I'm your host, Kevin Sapansky. Let's talk. Welcome back. Today, we are pleased to have Reggie DeGene join us from Lolly Insurance. Reggie is the Director of Operations, which is a new role for him. But for the last 20 years, Reggie has been involved in the insurance industry, including the underwriting and marketing of cybersecurity products. Reggie, welcome to CyberSip. Kevin, thanks for having me. So today's episode is, do I really need cyber insurance? And I thought we'd start off 2023 with an episode like this, because there's been a lot of talk out there about where the cyber market is going and is the market even going to exist in five years. And so I thought we'd return to basics with, do we really need it? And so my first question for you is, when a customer asks you, what is cyber insurance and do I need it? What do you say? Usually what I, thanks for the question, Kevin, but what I usually like to do is start out with an example of, of a typical claim that we see, because that tends to really uh, answer many of the questions that the client has. But what we see in a typical claim is that it's either usually through email that somebody will uh, infiltrate the system and a user, the employee will click on the email and then that will start the ransomware and, and, and open up the, uh, the malware, which leads to the rans ransom demand and the ransomware. Uh, that's when the client realizes that something has happened and they can try to unplug their computer as quickly as they can, but that's usually too late. Um, the scenario would be that you have a ransom demand that's being asked. You know, so what do you do there? Uh, if you have a cyber liability policy, you have coverage for uh, the extortion or ransom demand. You also have the legal costs, which you're going to almost immediately incur, and then also the forensic. And those costs are within the first 24 hours. You know what your costs are going to be because they're going to ask you what the what the ransom is going to be. They're going to let you know what the what the, you have to pay in order to free up your data. And then again, the legal and the forensic. The forensic can start almost immediately, you know, even from a distance. It's amazing what some of these forensic firms can do. Uh, so you definitely want to engage them. The part that people don't always think about with cyber liability coverage is the business interruption because they think about their data, they think credit card information, it's not that important, uh, no one's going to really ask me for anything. Um, and, and to some degree that may be true, but the business interruption is real. And what happens is that if you have maybe 20 or 30 computers, if you're a smaller company, many times you have to bring each one of those uh, devices back up individually. So that forensic firm is going to be doing that. But in the meantime, we have seen in many of our losses that the business may be out between one and three weeks that they are not able to operate. So the loss of income and all the payroll and everything else that you have to pay for, uh, that business interruption coverage is can be a critical aspect to really saving your business because it's, the statistic is still there that 60% of small businesses will fail within six months uh, of a cyber breach. So that's what we usually talk to the clients about. So if we have those four things, the cyber extortion, the, the legal, forensic, and the business interruption, think about that first, even though there are many other coverages involved with the cyber policy. So that makes great sense. And now we're, you've convinced me, and I want to look into the purchase of cyber insurance. But my next question is, okay, how do I get it? Is there an application process and what information do I need to put together to prepare for that application? Talk us through that and maybe first, Reggie, tell us about how the application process has evolved over time. I know it wasn't too long ago where there were two or three questions on the application and there were no questions about system controls and malware and so on. So. What was it like a few years ago and how has that changed over time? Sure. So if you go back about 15 years ago, it really, it wasn't so much cyber policy or coverage as it was a network security for IT firms, people who were in the network area. And those applications were very lengthy. And over time, people developed and, and Ace Insurance was one of the first companies to come out with the privacy liability coverage form. And that was, you know, maybe six or seven pages long. And then it really, as more companies came in, because there are not a lot of new insurance products. So this was a new insurance product that companies could come in and take advantage of. So they limited the questions to 
many times, like you were saying, it could be two to three, sometimes no questions other than the obvious ones of the firm name, address, revenue, and maybe a number of employees. And then right. they would put it into a little model and then they come out with a, with a premium. And many times it was pretty aggressive premium. So you have where there was no underwriting involved, there was no very little, to little claims involved. So the market became softer and softer. The questions became, again, non-existent. And then fast forward to right before two, uh, the COVID, in the end of 2019, we started seeing the losses starting to escalate and escalate very quickly. The common denominator was multi-factor authentication, that if you didn't have that, that's how people were really taking advantage and getting into your, into your systems. So then a lot of questions started coming out to the point now where we're not back up to the 15 page application, but we are, you know, asking a lot of questions on the application. Uh, the biggest questions of which are, you know, multi-factor authentication, do you have that in place? And what are your remote protocols? With everybody working remote, you know, what kind of safeguards do you have in place to protect your systems from, from an intruder? So you go through that application process, and, and thank you for that. So multi-factor authentication, remote protocols, a more, more kicking the tires from the standpoint of the right. carrier. So you complete the application, which is not 15 pages, but, but, but somewhere in between. So I've seen five, seven, eight page applications. You complete this application. And how does that process work, Reggie? Who's, where are you drawing the information from to complete the application? Who is in charge of the document itself? I really want to give our, our audience a sense of how this process works, because I think a lot of folks don't really understand it. And they may not appreciate how many people within their organizations need to contribute. Yeah, so the older applications, you could pretty much answer by either giving to someone in your IT department or maybe even someone that just deals with the insurance on a day-in and day-out basis, your risk manager who may not know all the IT issues that are there. Uh, it has evolved now where you really need to get, if you have an internal IT department, you want to get them involved. And if you contract out those services, you want to have your service provider take a look at the questions because they do get pretty technical. Again, multi-factor authentication or MFA is a big question. Uh, they want to make sure that you have the that in place for email, for almost any entry into your system. They want to make sure that those people who have the most um, access to your system, the administrative uh, codes or, or, or privileges, that they have multi-factor authentication in place. And sometimes we get pushback on that, but really, if you think about it, those are the individuals that have the greatest ac access to your system. So you want to make sure you lock those, those uh, uh, entry points into your system down. You want to lock them down as much as possible. Right. And if you have multi-factor authentication, it can bridge the gap when uh, you talk about the strength of your passwords because you're adding a measure of protection beyond just Correct. the passwords itself. And I know the, the carriers are asking, do you have a password policy? What are your security controls? And also some of the applications ask about employee training. So what are you seeing in that area, Reggie? And what are the carriers interested in when they ask about training programs that policyholders have in place? Yeah, well, you want to have at least an annual uh, training. What we have done here is we are going to a quarterly training. So instead of doing a 45 minutes to an hour annual training, we're trying to break it up into 15 minute increments to up and on a quarterly basis. Because the more your employees are aware of what some of the catches are that they can fall subject to or, or what some of the, uh, you know, we talk about phishing and, and you don't want to get the, you know, if that hook comes in, you want to be able to identify that hook before you, you snatch onto it. So the, the training for your employees, again, your greatest asset your employees can also be your greatest, greatest point of vulnerability. Yes. And curiosity always gets a better of people, uh, myself included. I'm not Mine, immune. Me too. <laughs> you, see those, you see those emails and uh, you think, huh, I, I'm not sure if I was waiting for that one, but let me see what it is. And you open it up and then that, by that time it is too late. Right. If you have not been fooled by one of those spear phishing attacks, you're not human, uh, especially yeah. around holiday time. That was one that fooled me because I had so many packages coming in and I got, uh, I think it was an SMS message from Amazon or maybe it was DHL asking me to confirm some information for a shipment. And I did it so quickly because I needed the, the, the gifts so quickly that I didn't bother to think that, gee, I don't actually have something coming from DHL 
for this service provider. And it ended up clicking on a link. Fortunately, it was a test link that was sent to me by my, uh, my employer. So nothing bad happened, but it's very easy to fall prey to those, isn't it? It really is. I mean, we had that in our office. The one that was the most successful was uh, a email that came in with a click uh, to a video or to a, a picture of a dog in the neighborhood that has been lost. And they're asking Ooh. people to you know, click on the picture to see if you've seen the dog in the last hour or so. And and we got a lot of people with that one. You oh, know, yeah. Couldn't care less if you're trying to save a human being. But if, if it's a dog, it seemed to be uh, right. something that they right. wanted to click on. Creating a sense of urgency. That's what they do. Um, all right. So you've completed your you've completed an application on behalf of your policyholder and you submit it to a number of carriers. Right. And let's right. say you've submitted the application to five or six cyber insurance carriers. But in response, you get a no from every single one. Every single carrier has said, I'm sorry, we're going to pass on this risk because we don't think that you're insurable at this point. Have you had that happen uh, uh, to a, a, a customer at Lolly, Reggie? And what do you do when something like that happens? Yeah, fortunately, it's very rare that that happens. Uh, we had one where it was a client that had been trying to find their, they lost a renewal because they had a pretty significant loss and they were trying to find some coverage. So we went out to the market and the market, because of the type of loss, it was a, you know, it was, they didn't have the proper safeguards in place from MFA or multi-factor authentication. Uh, they just didn't, any, any box that you should be able to check yes, it seemed like they, were, they had a no checked off on that box. And with a pretty sizable loss, the fact that they had some pretty valuable data, it was in that situation, that was well, I, probably one of the few accounts I can remember that we just couldn't get any, any coverage for. And, uh, you know, they, they also, sometimes our clients have contract requirements. So in this case, it was very challenging for us because we knew the client had to provide proof that they had cyber liability coverage, but we were just not able to get it for them. Right. Um, they did have one option that was significantly less than what they had. So they needed 5 million limits. They got a million dollars and I think it was like a hundred thousand dollar deductible, uh, that their former agent, um, had as, as the only option for them. So I guess it wasn't completely no to the type of insurance, but it just, it didn't fit what they really needed to provide for their clients. So let's say a customer comes to Lolly tomorrow, Reggie, and says, you know, I don't know what to do. I, my, my prior broker uh, applied for insurance. We were unable to get it I'm coming to you. What's your best advice to an organization that may have tried to get insurance, but was declined? that particular time around. Yeah, so they definitely they want to get together and not just, uh, you know, there's IT and then there's, there's uh, security companies. So sometimes your IT provider is not necessarily the company you want to go to from a security right. aspect. So there are some that, are, that do both, but you want to make sure that you're working with somebody that's really strong on the security side of things and have them take a look at your system. Make sure that you do, in this case, you may have to provide a summary of a penetration test or any type of uh, um, testing that the security company is going to do once they implement some of the procedures that you really are going to need to to implement. You know, uh, IT security is no longer optional. It's it, it's a cost of doing business. So we, you know, certainly would tell the company if they weren't prepared for that that they have to budget that into that they have to make sure that is part of their budget the cybersecurity piece. And you know, we can try to uh, refer them to either a law firm or a forensic firm. Uh, the IT security company is going to be able to help them out because really from a legal standpoint, you want to make sure that they're working with the law firm that's going to be what sometimes is referred to as their breach coach. That's going to be the first line of, of defense when something happens. So if you get that next potential claim, you're going to call your, your, the law firm that you're working with, and then usually they will be the one to contact and get a hold of a forensic firm, as you know, because that keeps everything privileged and confidential as much as possible uh, when you do have the, the legal firm involved right from the beginning. So, Reggie, even if an organization is unable to get insurance, you're saying that they should still take that step to vet a law firm who can serve as a breach coach, a forensic vendor who can respond to the breach, and maybe even a ransomware firm who can be called on if there's a ransomware attack. The company should have those pieces in place, 
even if it doesn't have insurance, so that it, it knows who to turn to when that inevitable cyber incident happens? Correct. Yeah, it's uh, the, equated to your furnace goes out, uh, you know, December 24th and you have guests coming over, or you have guests in the house plus more coming over on the 25th. You know, you want to make sure that you're, uh, you, you, you have a you have a, a HVAC contractor in mind. You're going to pay more, uh, but you want to make sure that you have someone that you can get a hold of. And the same thing with the legal and, uh, and forensic. You, you want to have those contacts in place. Uh, never mind the fact that you want to have the the fee structure in place god forbid something happens because i can pretty much assure you that you're not going to have a claim that's going to happen between nine and five monday through friday that it's going to be on a weekend when you least expect it and you're most vulnerable because guess what that's when they can get the ransom demand yeah. on you more quickly because you are in that situation yeah you want your breach coach lawyer on speed dial and you don't want to be meeting that lawyer or the forensic firm or the ransomware firm for the first time when you suffer the breach. You want to have met them and vetted them in advance. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Um, I know we're out of time. We'll leave it there. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I'd love to have you on on another episode to talk about a, a, a comment made about the the existence of cyber insurance uh, came recently in December last year, and I'd love to have you on to talk about it sometime. Kevin, thank you again. I appreciate being on, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. appreciate it. Reggie DeGene of Lolly Insurance, thanks to all of you for joining us. We'll be back soon with another episode. The CyberSip Podcast is available on BarclayDamon.com, YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Like, follow, share, and continue to listen.